Gather round, children, as today I'm going to tell you the story of the not-so-golden boy, Flock. Now, as I'm sure you know, in the tail end of the 80s, there was a large craze for creating mascots to push a brand. Everyone wanted to be the next Mario or Pac-Man, someone that you could just put on a cereal box and point at and say, I recognize that guy, I want to support him, that must be good, it's got his face on it, let's get it. Well, come 1991, our boy Sonic the Hedgehog rolls in and suddenly adds a new stipulation to this Me Too mascot craze. Now they have to be cool and edgy. And for the next couple of years, there was countless numbers of really, really stupid wannabe mascots who were just trying to be cool and edgy and with it and radical, as we in the 90s may have at one point said. Well, come 1993, when Bubsy the Bobcat shows up, basically dashing every future mascot's dreams of being the next big thing. Why? Well, he was loud, he was obnoxious, his game wasn't terribly good, and he was just all around annoying. And he basically single-handedly killed the mascot craze that had been going on for about five years at that point. And come on, if it wasn't Bubsy, it was Awesome Possum. Well, a few months later, after everyone was sick of Me Too mascots, comes our boy Plock here. And that's probably why no one really recognizes or even remembers him. He was just a little too late to the party. And it's a shame too, because while there were countless platformers which were simply jumping and running from one point to the other, Plock had a lot of originality. And I think he deserves to be a lot better remembered than just some flash in the pan next to Bubsy. So the story of Plock is simple. Plock is a <laughs> and as a member of that specific race, it allows him to throw his fists. So he was basically a prototype for Rayman, two years before Rayman, and then after that Rayman would have to learn how to throw his fists and catch. Basically what I'm saying is Rayman tried to be Plock, but not half as good at it. But in addition to being able to throw his fists, Plock could also throw his legs and use his various extremities to hold down switches while he hopped around as a singular torso. So I guess he was also the prototype for that never-dead guy. I'm thinking Konami might owe Plock some money. Anyway, Plock uses these abilities to achieve his one singular goal, to retrieve a flag with his face on it. Exactly like every other flag with his face on it that's currently scattered around his island. He's something of a narcissist, is basically what I'm saying. But the neat thing is the story expands well on from there, and the adventure from that point on is the interesting bit. There's tons of puzzles, platforming, and varied action sequences, along with tons of new abilities. Now the basic premise for Plock is simple enough. You start at one end of an area, and you try to get to the other end, to raise a flag at the end of the level to indicate that you own that piece of land once again because he's also a property mogul, hoping to tax everyone and anything that steps on his land, which can only be achieved if you own every part of land. Very clever. Anyway, in order to do this, of course he runs, he jumps, he throws his fists to attack enemies, but there's tons more. He has several different transformation sequences, He's got a buzzsaw power-up, which is kind of neat. He has a hunter power-up. He's got a crazy boxer power-up, which, on a side note, when you get that power-up, it actually plays a little bit of the Rocky theme, which I don't even like Rocky. I thought that was a really clever touch. And all these different abilities help keep the gameplay feeling fresh. It never really feels boring, despite the fact that every level is basically the same general concept like every other platformer, which is start at one place, get to the other place. And I think the fact that Plock distinguishes himself as a character who has a ton of varied traits and abilities allows the gameplay to stand out compared to other mascot platformers at the time. Now that's not to say that platforming is without problems, there are quite a few. One of the biggest problems I've noticed is that while there aren't instant death pits, there are near instant death pits. Essentially you fall to the bottom of the area and you'll get ejected from the bottom while taking some damage. And that's fair, except that while you can occasionally find a way out of it, it's generally very hard to, so you're basically dead anyway, and it's really just prolonging the experience. And that's no fun. The second biggest problem I have with the overall mechanics is that the game doesn't really ever convey how much health you have. Oh sure, you've got this health bar at the bottom, 
but it's not really ever clear how much health you have. I mean, that health bar kind of lies. It's not like every single tick on the health bar denotes one hit. Plot can generally take three or four hits before dying, which kind of makes that entire health bar seem somewhat of a lie. It's very unclear how much health you ever have at any one point. In addition, enemy and obstacle placement is a little bit weird sometimes. I noticed there were a lot of obstacles that would just spawn coming at you full speed with very little time to react, and in order to navigate it competently, you kinda had to know it was coming in the first place. And that slowed down the entire experience, and I wasn't a big fan of that. My one final gripe with the overall gameplay of Plock is simply the fact that there's really no way to save your progress and continue at a later date. There's no in-game battery backups, so no save files, there's no password system, and I noticed this game was actually pretty difficult, which of course means that it fosters lots of replayability, but also makes it very frustrating, especially if you can't continue where you left off. Now there are bonus levels which you can find that allow you to skip past certain levels, and that's a nice idea, but the way these level warp areas were created seems a little bit mean. So when you go into these level warp areas, you are presented with a sort of minigame. You have to complete the minigame to move on. You know, fair enough, I suppose. But instead of, say, requiring a basic understanding of the mechanics you would have learned up to the point you were warping to, which would have made sense, instead you get a vehicle section. And while I think these vehicles are cool on paper, unfortunately they all kind of control like ass. Like, you move way too fast, you die way too easily, again from obstacles that come at you way too fast for you to react to, and they're just generally very clunky. And in the end, these areas as a whole are not only frustrating, it has very little to do with showing your skills and that you're prepared to go to the area you're warping to, and really just sort of comes across as a complete and total random crapshoot of whether or not you'll survive or not. And that's just not good. You should try and always remove as much randomness from games as you possibly can. At least, that's my philosophy. That said, as difficult as Plock is, provided you've got the time to plunk down, you're in for a very long adventure, and it's a varied one. The visual presentation of this game is really nice. Everything has a bright, colorful look to it. I noticed some of the backgrounds actually looked a little bit out of, like, Yoshi's story, where it looked like it was all, like, pencil crayoned in. I really love that look. Just something about it looks rustic and just kind of nostalgic, and I really like that. The enemies are fairly creative, and everything seems to have just a little bit of personality to it. I'm a big fan of how all the characters seem to be bright colors, and they contrast well with the environment. The audio presentation is alright. While the sound effects are not really anything special, the music is definitely something of a character on its own. Just something about the soundtrack to this game sounds very unique to this game, and I can't say I've ever heard anything quite like it anywhere else. Maybe it's the MIDI harmonica. I don't know. But the soundtrack's really good. And that is the story of Plock, a game that was passed over because the competition was so bad, no one wanted to take a chance on a mascot they didn't recognize anymore. And unfortunately, Plock wasn't the only casualty in this trend. I could name a good dozen others which really should have caught on but didn't. And it's a shame too, because Plock is a decent game. Would I recommend it? Well, Plock does have his problems. Annoying bonus levels, no way to save your progress, no passwords, but at the same time, I also have to admit, I'm a big fan of the amount of creativity put into Plock. And it definitely feels like all the different ideas that came together in Plock, while they don't necessarily all work, it does feel like a lot of passion was put into Plock. And I think if you're a fan of the Super Nintendo and platformers, I think you should look out for Plock, especially if you can get it at a decent price. And it is sad to see some of the different creative concepts in Plock work far better in other games that have since gone on to be much more popular and not ever see a Plock 2. That said, however, the Pickford brothers, the two guys who came up with Plock, did retain the rights to their character, so there's no ruling a Plock 2 out completely. And until then, they're continuing to make a webcomic starring the little... whatever the hell he is. And that's a decent read, go check that out. But in the end, I just have to say this. While Plock wasn't necessarily the best mascot platformer in the 16-bit era, 
I think he deserves a lot more credit for his creativity than anyone ever gives him. Thank <laughs> you.